Well, we come to Colossians chapter 3, and I'm sort of taking a little extra time here, because um, I just sense that's what the Lord's doing uh, amongst us. So we charted chapter 3, and we looked at the first four verses, and we saw there that the first step is we got to get our eyes on Jesus, you know, not on the... The, the height of a human being, not on the height of a hill, not on the height of a mountain, not on the height of the moon or the stars, but we need to see Jesus. And it's not vague. It's not a cloudy, misty. I think that's a person. I, did you see the angel in the cloud? You know, uh, people are always doing that. No, it's clear. We see him. We see him at the right hand of the Father, and he's sitting. It needs to be clear. The only time, or there is no time in the priestly duty in the Jewish priesthood they ever sat down. As we're going to be going through Exodus, you'll see there's no chairs. <laughs> there's no place to sit. Because the priest's job is, is eternal. <laughs> they always got to be doing another sacrifice, another sacrifice, burning more incense, lighting more candles, uh, doing the routine on behalf of, and that was only to cover the sins of the people, so the wrath of God didn't pour upon them. But in Christ, he finished it, right? On the cross, it is finished. And he sat down. The the high priest, our high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, sat down because it is finished. And we looked at this last week in Hebrews, says twice, very specifically, yes, for justification, to be born again, to be righteous, that's been finished. But he also says sanctification is finished. That Christ did the work of sanctification. So really, positionally, he already sees us sitting with him at the right hand of the Father. I don't know if we're on Jesus' lap or we're in between the Father and him cuddling up. I I don't know. I, I sort of picture sitting on his lap and pulling on his beard and making fish face with his lips and just hanging out, you know, just enjoying being with dad. But it's important that we understand that we're not fighting from or for victory. We're fighting from victory. It's already finished. So really, We're already going to be sanctified, holy, and our brand new body's perfect. And this almost sounds heretical, but righteous as Jesus is righteous. Isn't that crazy? Because he gave that to us as a gift. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we, what? Might become the righteousness of God. Whoa. So, again, we've got to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect to make it to heaven. We can never attain to that. But Christ as a gift has given us that. So really, when we talk about sanctification, we're talking about this little period of time after you become born again to when you leave this body, whether that's death or the rapture of the church. So in that period of time, God says... James, he says, if you fight temptation, there's a crown. There's a crown that I'll give you for that. There's a, several different crowns that are given as rewards. And then also the Bible says that to, to the degree that we walked in sanctification, it'll give us a position for eternity. Some will not reign over any cities. Some may reign over one city. Some people may reign over 10 cities. And and, and and Jesus makes it clear, store up treasure in heaven. You're going to wish that you weren't just in the kingdom, but that you have a position in the kingdom to rule and reign with Christ, to be kings and priests unto our God. You're going to want rewards, Jesus says. You're going to want to have lived the sanctified life. So somebody can believe and never have any sanctification on this earth. Like the, the guy on the cross, right? No rewards in heaven. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that there, there's some Christians, I, I'm not doubting their salvation, Paul says very clearly, I'm not saying they're not saved, 
because the foundation is Christ and he lays that stone. But now it's up to you how you're going to build on that house. And the day of judgment, we're not going to stand before the white throne of condemnation, but we're going to stand before the bema seat of reward or lack of it. And he said there's going to be some Christians, not one brick of sanctification. All their life after being a born again, they, they have no good fruits that are going to pass the fire test to give them reward in heaven. So they're saved, but with zero reward. And Paul says, I fear for that. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, I, I, I fear that, that you're, you're not being obedient to God. And he says, for me, whether I'm in the body or out of the body, my life is to be pleasing to him. And I'm saying this to you because we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, referring to Christians here, the Bema seat, and give an account of all that we've done in our bodies, good and bad. So there is that moment in time. John writes in 1 John 2, he says, abide in him, little children. So when he appears, you don't shrink away in shame. So there is going to be a very clear moment of knowledge of Jesus and who he is and how he could have lived, should have lived. No, the Bible tells us clearly how to live, but yet we are so comfortable in our flesh and enjoying uh, the pleasures of this life that we just, ah, going to church, <coughs> ah, not today, you know. This finger hurts. Oh, I got a hangnail. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to read the Bible today. I got a hangnail. And I think a lot of places like us where persecution hasn't come, we, we don't appreciate the simplicity of walking a sanctified life. Well, as we went on, we saw in verse 5, the second step is we must put to death those sexual sins desires that are outside of the marriage bed. So this is interesting to me. Because Paul's going to describe the next step. Most of our sanctification is about constantly taking off the old man and putting on the new man. That's what he gives most of the verses to. We're, not, we're just going to mention it today and talk about it, and then we're going to look at the different ways. So we you, you were constantly taking off and putting on. But he says before that third process can happen, you've got to put to death every sinful desire sexually. Wow, that's, that's something because the, the sex drive is a powerful drive. And I, I think Satan, being aware of mankind, is constantly, almost in every society, making that the God, right? The God of sex, the God of sexuality, to stir up everybody, to, to want any kind and every kind of sex, as long as it's not in marriage. So God created sex, and there's only one place that the fires and the passions of sex can be, and that is inside marriage. Outside of that, it's sin. We talked about that, how fire in a fireplace is wonderful. Take the fire and put it in the living room. People get hurt and die. The house burns down, right? Put it in the bathroom. Same thing. Put it in the bedroom. It, the fire has to stay controlled in one specific place. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, all other sins are outside the body. But when you sin sexually, you sin against yourself. Like, what's that mean? Meditate on it. I think it's our soul. I, I think we sin against ourselves because we really can't go to step three of sanctification, of taking off until we first put to death. So he didn't say take off the sexual sins. He didn't say that. He said it's got to be put to death. And you can't have this giant python, you know, in containment in your house saying as long as I keep it fed, it'll be docile. And one day you forget to feed it and it's climbed into the baby's bed, swallowing the baby. No, you got to put to death the python. You got to put to death that, that sin in order to now start being able to have your mind clear and your body out of prison 
to be able to start saying, okay, now let's work on the more refined areas of sanctification. For example, anger and greed. These lesser things that are also sins, but they don't sin against the body like the sexual sin does. And so this is what we talked about in verse 7 through 9 is taking off. We didn't get to put it on yet, but take off those old clothes. So today, the opposite. We're not going to be talking about taking off. We're going to talk about putting on. And um, so put to death, put off, and now today put on. So you can tell a person by their clothes, right? If a person's a doctor and they're, they're in Starbucks, you, you can look at it and go, oh, that guy's in the medical field at least, probably a doctor. Or uh, a police officer, he's, you know, he finished his shift and he still has his uniform on and he's at McDonald's, you're like, oh, he's, he's a police officer, off duty police officer. Or a firefighter or somebody in the military, you, you can tell who they are by the clothes they wear. So Paul, in essence, is saying that when we take off the uniform that everybody in the world who doesn't know Christ is wearing, and we put on the uniform that represents Christ in his nature, then people will see us the way they, they would see Christ. And it will lead them to Christ. We'll be a salt to the earth, bringing flavor. Also, if you got a cut, it's going to sting. <laughs> Sometimes we sting people. But we're also the light unto the world. In the simplest of ways, people are angry today. Have you guys noticed that? It's like a spirit of anger. I think it's been attacking me all week. But we recognize that we are of Christ by obviously the clothes we wear, such as love and peace and patience, kindness and goodness. So verse 10 and 11 today. And have put on the new man who renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So looking at verse 10 here, we put on now the new man who's renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him, Jesus, who created him. So first of all, he's saying that this positionally has already happened at the moment you were born again, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17, uh, all the old things have passed away, all things become new. So the moment we said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, be the Lord of my life, at that moment in our hearts, that old sinful nature was circumcised, Romans 2 tells us, and was taken out of the way, and immediately, we are now a new creature. So we are now a person that has a clear image of Jesus. But unfortunately, our flesh and Satan and the world is always putting on their clothes, trying to cover that up, right? I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. But then Satan says, hey, come on, put your arm in here. Come on, put your arm in here. And all of a sudden... I'm looking like the lustful, greedy, angry, selfish world around me. I'm a Christian. Really? No, not, not wearing that coat. No, no, no. You're, that's I have that exact same coat on right now. And we're like, you're kidding. Ah, get that off of me. And then we got to put on the new one. And, and it, it's, it just happens all day. It happens every day. We got to keep taking it off and putting it on. You know, I, I guess sort of, Sort of like a model at a model show, right? <laughs> Got to go put on new garments and walk down the, the aisle, put on another dress, walk down. We're, we're constantly doing that. We get it on in the morning, spend some time in the Word and prayer, and we, we get our, whoo, yeah, look at that. Oh, I finished my coffee. I'm so full of love and kindness. And we get out of the freeway, and it's like, ah, ah, no, no, get back on here. Get that love and kindness and, you know, self see I don't want to be... I, I, this is a constant battle. So it's something that's already happened. God's already made it possible to happen. You see, non-Christians can't put on new garment that's made in the image of Christ. Because first you have to have the image of Christ in your heart, right? 
It has to happen spiritually in our lives. Or we can never wear any of the garments. The only reason we can wear a new garment is because we really have been changed. And so he talks about the power of this newness of life. The main thing Paul talks about in Romans 6 is that sin no longer has dominion over us. You see, the people in the world, their sin of anger is on them, but their heart's still full of anger. They've got greed upon them, but that's their nature to be greedy because they're not born again. Now, I'm not saying they don't have lovely characteristics because we've been made in the image of God. But through sin, that image is so tainted now. But I'm not saying that a non-Christian doesn't love his wife. I'm not saying an atheist doesn't love his children. Okay? I'm not saying that the image of God is completely gone in man. It's not. People are pretty amazing, pretty lovely people as we see the glimpses of the image of God. But I, I, think, I think we're seeing that image as we're coming towards the end of the days disappearing. You know, I, I, I've been watching, you know, what, what Philadelphia really looks like downtown, what San Francisco really looks like downtown. Have you seen that? The walking tours where some guy has a, a camera and he's walking downtown San Francisco. And it's like the most wonderful streets in San Francisco, all the shops are empty. And you can't even walk on the sidewalk because there's so many weird people just freaking out on the buses. Just, they're so spaced out. And, they, you know, they, they just pooped their pants and threw up on the guy next to them. And, and, they're, and, it, and it's just like the, the guy was talking, you know, a few years ago. This was the best shops to go in and out. This was the most lovely street. And you got this picture of the bay as you're walking. And he goes, now it's, it's unwalkable. <laughs> it's, there's nothing beautiful about this place. Well, th- that's the way the society is becoming. There's less loveliness about it. <laughs> you know, to go from here to there, we get on these horrible freeways. We, we've got literally the world telling us that there's five-year-old kids that are born a boy that really want to be a girl. That's what they're telling us. They really want that. We got to help them. And it's like, are you freaking insane? No, you're horrible for thinking I'm insane. <laughs> well, I, I don't think your five-year-old kid is thinking about sex at all unless you told them about it. And that's twisted. That's grooming. That's, that's, that's a crime in my book that that five-year-old kid even knows about sex. But now good is evil and evil is good and, and Lot's righteous soul was vexed every day in Sodom. But the Bible doesn't say remember Lot. It says remember Lot's wife. And what was Lot's wife? She's like going... I don't care about all the LGBTQ people. I don't care that all the men of this city tried to rape a couple angels. I love that place. I've got a lot of good friends in that place. I've got some incredible interior designers. (laughs) I don't want to leave Sodom. Even though it's completely perverted, I still love being there. I still love living there. And those people are wonderful. It doesn't matter that they're perverted and and, and an abomination in God's sight. I I don't really care about any of that. I just love my house and my yard and love all the dramas and and the city theaters. and, And when she looked back longingly going, oh, that's my heaven. I can't, I can't. I just love it there. She was turned to a a pillar of salt. And he says to us, don't become Lot's wife. I think her righteous soul was probably vexed as well, but more than that, she just had lukewarmed into just enjoying and not being grieved 
over what God was grieved over. And so here we see in Romans 6, verse 4 through 7, therefore we're buried with him through the baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And so we also should, doesn't say you're going to, but you should walk in the newness of life. It's up to you. Do you understand? We were buried with him. We rose again from the dead. We have the power of the resurrection. So now you can either walk like the rest of the world walks, which takes no effort, just do nothing, right? It's like a big inner tube in a river. You just do nothing. You lay there and it's going to take you downstream. So don't do anything and you'll just be like the world going downstream. But you should fight it and start paddling upstream and live in a newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It makes sense. And he's, since he made us alive spiritually, we should live like we're alive spiritually. But see, somebody can be born again and they have this moment of being alive spiritually, but then they don't take up the cross and start following Jesus. They don't deny themselves of this world and all of its joys and glories, the cares of this life, the desire of other things, the deceitfulness of riches, choke them out. And even though they're born again, you can't see it in their life. And he's saying, does that make sense? No, it doesn't. In verse six, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And then he says it as a fact, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So the condemnation of sin, the record of our sin, God's no longer taking it. We're just his children, and and he will, our spirit grieves when we're not walking in the spirit. God will tell us that we're in sin and we need to confess our sin. And God cleanses us and, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness and keeps us, standing before him positionally in a perfect righteousness. But how you live with your hand, with your mouth, with your eyes, with your ear, with your, your life, it should also reflect that we've been risen from the dead. But this is up to you. In verse 8 through 11, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. So does death ever going to be an issue in Jesus' life ever again after he raised from the dead? No. Nor should the deadness of sin be in our lives anymore, he's saying. In verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the light that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon. There it is. It's an accounting term. Paul says, put off. Same way. Put off or reckon. Do the calculation. Add it up. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that, that's a calculation term. You know, you got your calculator out and you put in the numbers and then the total, you're wrecking it. You're, you're, reckon, you're, you're reconciling your books. This, this is this word. Reconcile. You're dead to sin. You've been alive with Christ. You were with Christ on the cross. You were with Christ when he was buried, and you were with Christ when he raised from the dead. Calculate this out. You have the possibility of walking in the newness of life, just like Jesus raised from the dead, and death, and sin, and the darkness of this earth has no power over Christ anymore. He's already seated at the right hand of God. Well, there you go. He's already in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Go back. Ephesians 2.8. We are already seated with him in heavenly places. As he is, so are we in this world. It is something that is possible for us. Non-Christians, they can try to put on goodness and love and meekness and and kindness. They can't do it. it. It won't go on them. Only those who have been born again in the Spirit and have been made righteous before God and given righteousness, we alone can put on these garments. And it's something that we have to, we have the possibility to do and we must continue to do it. Now, before I can put on the new garment, 
guess what? I, I, this coat won't fit until I take off the old coat, right? So this coat fits me perfectly, but not if there's already a stinky, smelly coat, you know? And, and, and think of this. You're walking in downtown San Francisco or L.A., and you see this street person's coat laying on the ground, all smelly and gooey, and there it is. You pick it up going, a free coat. Look at this. It's anger, but it's okay. It's free. Ooh, look at this anger I'm walking around in. Look at this lust I'm walking around in. Look at this greed I'm walking around in. Dude, it smells. It's gross. Take that thing off. Last night, we were here with a special Christmas, uh, what's it called? Festival. Festival. And there was this one boy, and his parents were right there. He was going around and putting his hand inside every trash can and walking around. And then he would go to the next trash can and put his hand and walk around it two or three times. And, go to, and I'm just like going, parents. <laughs> and then, you know, he's getting some food and eating. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't a kid, it was Dennis. I told, him, I told him to stop it, and he didn't do it again after that. But, uh, no. It's, it's beyond ridiculous that we don't know we gotta take off this stuff. It's beyond ridiculous. We've all been enlightened, because God's spirit is in us, that we must wear the garments of peace and joy and kindness and goodness and forgiveness and gentleness, right? And this is what he's saying. It's possible for you, and it's more than possible for you. It's really something that you should be doing because you've died with Christ. You're buried with Christ. You rose again with Christ. It should look like that. Your life has the ability to look like the resurrected Jesus. You can be a light, not to a couple of people, but to the world. You can be the salt, not to your city, but to the earth. This is how powerful you are as a resurrected, born-again believer. And so now he says, be renewed. Now this is interesting. Because he's going to tell us to be renewed in the knowledge but it's something that it's not a fleshly endeavor. You know, I, I know people that, that say, man, I'm going to be renewed. I'm going to start fasting four days a week and I'm going to, you know, do that. I'm going to do that. And, and they start living this legalistic. It starts looking like all of the religions. You know, he, he, he's living this religious life trying to get his flesh in check. How do we put on that garment? Self-discipline. That's how you get that garment on. Just never go to the beach again. Just never eat any sweets ever. Just never watch any TV. Just when you go home, just shut the door and have a room. It's only dark and there's no furniture in there. And, and read the Bible until you fall asleep. Every, every night, the rest of your life. It's like, no. The whole point of Christianity is that we live in the world looking and, and moving about, not religiously, not oppressed by our religion. Most people, when you talk about going to church, going to a prayer meeting, coming to Christ, they just think of like the Catholics and just oppressing you. I got to go into this thing and the guy's speaking Latin and he's waving this censer and lighting this candle and he's got these robes on and I just, I'm just like, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. I have no idea what's going on. But this is what I got to do. The Muslims, they got to have their rug and they got to face east. And for an hour, they got to do this. The, the Buddhists, they got to shave their head. They got to wear these robes. They got to climb up these stairs. They got to gang these bongs and, and light these candles. And, and the Mormons, you know, they got to all look like a Mormon and <laughs> no coffee. And you got to do this. And you got to, Jehovah Witnesses, they got their. Look, and they got their briefcase. That's not the way you live holy. 
We, li- we drive same cars as everybody. We live in houses next to everybody. We go to work like everybody else. Just, we're free. What, what, what is it? Do we need a special rug? Do we need a special building? Do we, what, what do we need? You know, I don't even have to pray out loud. I can just pray in my heart. And that's enough. God's satisfied with that. He hears the meditation of my heart. The Bible doesn't say to read the Bible. Hold it. The Bible doesn't say to read the Bible. No, it doesn't. I know people, they religiously, uh, there's my chapter of the day. Fine, I hope you like it. I'm out of here. Uh. No, it says meditate in the word. It's something you're enjoying. It's something that, that you, with the willingness of your heart, want it to become a part of you. And God says, I so want to encourage this that I'm going to put the greatest blessing on this. I'll have you prosper in everything you do if you're meditating the word day and night. So we can pray without ceasing. We can meditate on the word day and night and just constantly ask God to fill us up with this Holy Spirit. And when you're driving home from work and the guy cuts you off and all of a sudden you look down and it's like, ah, how did this garment of anger get on me? How did, where did this rage come from? You quickly get rid of that. Take it off. Don't, don't crash, but take that <laughs> garment off and you know, reach into the other thing and put on self-control. Put on kindness and goodness. And don't, don't let the world bring you into its grip. Don't let sin bring you into this grip. So he, when he says being renewed, he's not telling you that you, it's up to you to complete yourself. The new self is complete, but it does have the capacity to grow. Like a baby we've been born, we have the capacity to grow. So God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, all agree that you are now a new man or a new person through Christ Jesus. Therefore, all that is needed is you, is in you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, by the simplicity of just walking in Him. What does God require of you, man? To do justly, to do righteously. God wants me to do righteously. To love mercy, no problem there. And to walk humbly with your God. He's not wanting to put on, trade out the Old Testament laws for a bunch of New Testament laws. And then in Romans 6, verse 12 through 14, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal flesh. There it is. That you should obey its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So you're never going to be condemned for your sin. There's no record keeping of your sin. When we sin, we just agree with God at sin, and he's faithful and righteous to cleanse us of that sin and from all unrighteousness. But constantly, Satan, the world, is going to dangle our flesh, our old garments in front of us, urging us to put on those old garments. But we need to remember, although the outward man is perishing, (laughs) yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The strength and the power to live in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to, to live out the complete image of Christ, All the world are made in his image, but they can't walk in that image, but we can as born-again believers. So be renewed. What does this mean? Why is it so important? Because we need to understand renewed, we will then understand the difference between being reformed by ourselves and transformed by the renewed of our mind. I talked about this just a second ago, but there's a huge difference between seeking to be reform yourself and to let God transform your life. The difference is between you doing a work on your own and your own strength and your own effort. What does Paul say in Galatians? Are you going to perfect in the flesh what God started in the spirit? And the word of God and the spirit of God does the work. One's a mess and the other is a glorious, wonderful transformation, renewal. So it's his spirit through the word. 
In 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled faces beholding in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. Wow, it's happening. The Spirit of God is transforming us from one glory to another glory. In John 17.17, 17, sanctify them in your truth, Jesus prays. Your word is the truth. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So be renewed in the knowledge. Interesting how many times Paul says this, but maybe people don't often catch it. In Philippians 1, 9, right after he said, he who began that good work and you will complete it, he goes on to say, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. This is not knowledge, a bunch of facts and data. It's experientially. As you keep receiving the mercies of God, you would give those same mercies. As God keeps forgiving you, you would be forgiving in the same way. As God loves you and is kind and and tender towards you, that you would be that person towards others as well. In Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come to the unity of your faith, to what? The knowledge, the experience, the gnosko, the experience and knowledge of the Son of God. We've all had God forgive us over and over and over again. We have this together, don't we? We have all experienced after some day, one day we sinned worse than we've ever sinned, and the next morning we wake up and we sense just God's mercies are new every morning. We've all been the prodigal son coming home going, oh boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear it <laughs> for, for the next 10 days in a row. Man, dad's going to rub my nose in it and tell me I just, you know, I made the bed sleep in it and all that. And we get it and the father just loving on us, not putting us on probation, not lecturing us, just loving on us. We've ex- all had this experience in God. And so this is the knowledge that brings us into perfection and to the stature of the fullness of Christ. In Philippians 3.8, yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of what? The knowledge of God through Christ Jesus my Lord. So one of the old fleshly things that people who were raised in a religion like Judaism or Catholicism or Mormonism or whatever is they've got to take off the garment of religion because religion makes you feel righteous. I'm righteous because the priest said I'm righteous. I'm righteous because I went to church. I'm righteous because I read the Bible. I'm righteous because, and, and, and they, they feel like, man, I, I get to make my own righteousness and this feels good. I don't have to count on somebody else making me righteous. I can count on myself to make myself righteous. Well, it's not a true righteousness. But nevertheless, Paul said, I, I had to learn to take off that garment of religiousness because I kept wanting to turn Christianity into another religion. And then he said, whom I've suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That's it. One more we had read earlier in Colossians in 1, 9 and 10. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with what? The knowledge of his will and all wisdom, spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. I love that, that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's what the new garments do. Put the new garment on, and I start walking in a way that really is representing Jesus. I begin fully pleasing God the Father, not bearing 20-fold or 60-fold, but 100% fruitfulness, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we need to have this going on in the renewing of our mind, in the knowledge, experiential knowledge. Yeah, sure, reading the Bible, but it's not just reading it, is it? It's God's Spirit speaking it into our hearts as we meditate on it and we pray about it and chew on it. And this is what I believe Romans 12, a very well-known passage we know, is talking about. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, 
which is a reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, renewed by the renewing of your mind. Again, the word of God, that you may prove what's good, acceptable, and even the perfect will of God. So the goal of this knowledge is not to be merely gain a bunch of head knowledge, but it's be to be conformed, transformed, renewed into the image of Christ who created us in his image. Now, according to this image of him who created him, number one, man is created in the image of God, but Satan hates that about us. Satan wants to deface the image of, <clears throat> Satan wants to deface that image in rebellion, degradation, though it can never, so it could be obliterated. So people say, why all of a sudden is homosexuality like just spreading? Why, why is all this trans, transgender stuff and all, all of a sudden it's like a wildfire? You're going to L to G, to B, to T, to Q. You guys know Q is queer, right? And I'm a queer. <laughs> it used to be a bad thing. But now it's a, a hallmark. And you're going, why, why is this happening? This is Satan. He, he literally does not want anybody to look like Jesus. He wants everybody in his image. If Satan could do it, he would take everybody by the hair and dunk you in a pile of poop and let you walk around. And all you can see is a chocolate-covered something with eyes that smells disgusting and walking around throwing up. That's all Satan wants us to look like. He doesn't want us to have hair, eyes, a smile, Hands, arm. He wants to degrade the image of Christ. Of course, this was he doing. But what did we learn in Romans 1? He said, The moment when men will not acknowledge God as creator, they'll acknowledge creation as creating itself. He says this in Romans 1. They worship the creature, but they won't worship the creator. He said, When a society gets broken to that degree, and now in this lostness, not wanting to give glory, to God is creating the world, they're going to start wanting to have sex with each other, men with men, women with women. And he says in Romans 1, you can read it, when that happens, I'm out of the way. I'm out of it. I was the wall holding men back, but I'm stepping out of the way. Now that society, and you can read the last two verses of Romans 1, he gives a very long list how it will be violent, disobedient to parents and, and unloyal. And it's just a whole giant list. And the last thing on that list is when they're that way, all the other sexualities will come in, bestiality and transgender and all this nonsense. And he said the one thing that'll happen at that point is they will not stop with evangelizing, trying to get everybody to be sexually perverted like them. So the last verse of Romans 1 says, that's what we're, we're seeing. The, the self-destruction of a society, just like Rome, was destroyed. So that's what we're watching. But we know that, that America eventually was going to be minimized. We just didn't realize how it was going to be minimized. And so right now, we're just lot trying to see if anybody will come with us. Last night, guys, we were out here. We had a spinning thing. Do you know John 3.16? We asked questions, sharing the Lord. These junior high kids would come up. I'm thinking of one girl in particular. And it was a real simple question, you know, who died on the cross or something like that. And it's like, I have no idea. Now, I, I had talked to a few other junior high kids that were, one said, oh, I'm a Jew. I, I know nothing about Christ. I was like, really? Because he, he's one of the top Jewish rabbis. <laughs> he's a Jew. Kidding. Jesus is a Jew? Oh, yeah. He came. The very first thing was to spread the, the gospel to the Jews and shared the Lord, and he's just soaking it up. No knowledge. But this young girl, it's like, well, how are you raised? You know, Catholic or Mormon? She goes, I, I, nothing. I just, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Do you have... Can you tell me one thing about God? No. 
No, I don't know one thing about God. And then you get three people like that in a row. Right here from our community, guys. <laughs> they didn't come from Mars. I told Cheryl afterwards, I, I said, I feel, like, I feel like we got dropped in the middle of a hedonistic world. You know, we got dropped in the middle of India or the, the middle of Afghanistan or something. It's just these people have no knowledge of Christ. And there was one mom that came up and she's with their kids. And same thing, all three of her kids, no knowledge of anything, just nothing about any religion. And, and, I, and I said to her, I said, well, how were you raised? Oh, I was raised a Christian. But you could tell on her face, she was just angry. And, and, and I'm like, so do you, do you think your kids have no knowledge of God? They're going to grow up to be good moral people? Well, I don't know why they wouldn't. Because morality comes from God. It's not what I say or you say or anybody else. It's God who gives us morality. Morality comes out of the Bible. Sociologists, at least they used to, back when I was in college, even the atheist sociologist said, the Judeo-Christian ethic is the best ethic. If you don't have that, you're, you're probably not going to want to live in that country if they don't have the Judeo-Christian ethic. Whatever country has a Judeo-Christian ethic is the best countries in the world. They just tell you that sociologically. But it was grievous to me. I'm still grieved over it. But the fact is, is Satan doesn't want us to have the image of God. So what should we want? We, wanna, we want to put Satan in his place. I mean, sometimes I want to live holy just to spit on the devil. It's like, okay, you, you, you know, here's a situation. I, I know it's spiritual. I, I know it can't, it's not just coming from humans being human. He's pushed every button. And it's just like, I'm going to represent Jesus just to make Satan look bad. Oh, what about me, Brian? Are you doing it to the glory of the Father? Oh, yeah, that too, that too. But right now, it's just, uh, just to punch Satan in the face on this time. So God's plan is to restore that image. And it's predestined to happen. In Romans 8.29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. It's going to happen that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then also in 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So since we still have room to grow, we should allow this renewing process to take place perpetually. And finally, in verse 11 here, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ does all and in all. At this time, and even into this day in most civilizations, guys, being prejudiced is not a bad thing. They, they're happy that they're prejudiced. They're happy their nation's prejudiced. Believe me, you go to Saudi Arabia, they are prejudiced against anybody <laughs> that's not exactly like them. I don't like Jews. I don't like people from Yemen. I don't like people from Iran. You know? Those people, they all smell bad and eat weird foods and their women are ugly. And Go to South America. They, they're not ashamed of being prejudiced. You will not find a South American guy that, that is somewhat white allowing his child to marry a darker person. It won't happen. You look on TV all through every Spanish-speaking country in the world, 27 of them, the people on TV are more white. <laughs> but yet you go to their countries, the majority of the people are dark-skinned, but they don't make it on TV. Okay, I'm saying that the idea that prejudice doesn't exist, it exists. And the only place that I've gone around the world and find it not existing is in the church. I, I've gone to countries, I don't know their language, but they're, they're, I'll meet them and it's just like instantly I love this person and they love me. And we want to know about each other. I go to the church, I remember in, in, in Hungary, going to the church and all these people 
were there just hungry for God. And, and, and some, this is actually in Yugoslavia, which is now Serbia. So Syria showed up and, and they saw these people. They were gypsies, the Romans. And, and this whole gypsy clan, which were in Satanism, literally they worshiped the devil. Two of them got saved and the whole clan got saved. And, and people coming in were just like, I don't want to go to this church. A bunch of gypsies here. Prejudiced. But again, in Christ, you know, we, we had all kinds of um, people that had come from India to, to, to go to school in Hungary. And, and you had people from all over. And you had rich people from Germany just hugging these Nigerian people and hugging these uh, gypsies. And there was just no prejudice in Christ. So where, where does it go away? It's not going to go away from beating you over the head and telling you you're evil because you were born a certain race or a certain color or within a certain economic status. No. In Ephesians 4, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's by this. He says in Romans 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called in all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity in the bond of peace. And then we know the Philippians 2 passage well, right? Be like-minded with Christ, of one accord with Christ, who, who saw everybody as better than himself, who saw everybody's interests more important than his own interest. You be that way towards one another. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So the first century racial problems or economic, I mean, the Jews really hated the Greeks. They would not go into their house. They would not buy food from their stores. The Jews kept themselves completely separate from everybody because everybody was dirty. I wouldn't, let a, I wouldn't let a Gentile put money in my hand. I'd put it in a cloth and then go home and clean it before I touched that money. And, and the Gentiles towards the Jews were no different. They hated the Jews. They hated them because they were separate. They hated them because they wouldn't buy from them. They, they, there was a great hatred between Jews and Gentiles in, in the Roman society. And of course, circumcised and uncircumcised. There was that religious distinction that was huge. And of course, both the Greeks and the Jews hated everybody who didn't speak Greek. It sounded to them, the barbarians, like they were saying, bar, 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 bar. Everything they said was bar, 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 bar. What are you saying? Speak a language I understand, which is Greek. And if you were not speaking Greek, you were not a cultural person. You were, you were like a rough, harsh person. And interesting, he says Scythian, which is modern day Russia. And it's funny because even today when Russians speak, even if they're telling you, I love you, it sounds like they're mad at you. They're singing this romantic song. And it sounds like somebody's going to get hurt. They still sound rough. They still sound coarse. But yet there's so many wonderful, beautiful Russian Christians in the Calvary chapels. Pray for them. And then a slave or free economically of those days. There's no economic difference. But Christ is all and in all. One place, walking together in unity. I've traveled a big part of the world, and the only place I have seen that is in the church. You're not going to find it in the clubs. You're not going to find it in the schools. Well, next week, we're going to look at some specifics of what to put on. As the elect of God, the holy, beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So when people see our outfit, our Christian outfit on, they'll know that we are Christians by what? Our love for one another. That's the bottom line. It starts right here in the family. It's so much easier to love everybody outside the family, you know? But you got to love your family. And, and the church becomes a family and, and we know about all our warts and, and scars and difficulties and struggles. And, and, and so the romance of getting to know people can burn off. But then we, we love actively. So let us be known this week by what we're wearing. 
and men would see our outfit on and they would know from what we're wearing. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the self-control that we are Christians. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word today and we ask in Jesus' name that you would take it and put it deep, deep, deep into our hearts. That we would know your heart, know your mind. That we would put on the new man, be renewed in the knowledge according to the image of Jesus we've been created and now we can walk in. And let us have a sweet love for one another, whether we're rich or poor, old or young, whatever our nationality, whatever our background, whatever our language, that we would just see through all of those silly things, really, and just love one another because your spirit is in them. And then let us go into the world where they're all screaming and yelling and fighting and being self-seeking and taking their interest uh, first, that we would go into the world and, and we would, they would see our uniform as we put their interests first, as we humble ourselves and serve even the lowliest of people, as we go into the world and, and instead of anger, it's love, instead of fighting, it's hugging. And we're just praying and meditating your word day and night, that we're getting strengthened in the inner man from glory to glory by the power of your spirit as we seek you, not by becoming religious, not by trying in the strength of our own flesh to make ourselves holy, but by seeking you more in prayer, by meditating your word more, by consciously just keeping our eyes on you, Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father, and seeing ourselves there as well, as you want us to right now. We know that we have overcome this world because your word abides in us. We've overcome the wicked one because your word abides in us. Strengthen us now that we as a church could be a light to this community. So many just literally a few feet away from us have no knowledge of you and it's to our shame. Jesus, it blew me away last night. My heart's still grieved. How many of these children have no knowledge of Christianity, and in many cases, their parents were raised in Baptist churches and Methodist churches and in and, and a good home where they went to church every week, but now, probably because they saw so much religion in all of it, it turned them off, but whatever reason, they have no desire for their kids to know anything about you. Rebuke them, Lord. Let the words that we planted last night, thousands of words, go forth and bring forth much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's all stand together.